The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Chris J from Feathercoin. Hello. Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Hey, it's good to be here. Derek J. Freeman from Peace News Now. Peace be with you. And Paige Peterson from San Francisco Bitcoin Meetup. Thanks for having me. Issue one, Bitcoin and sports. A very exciting weekend for Bitcoin and sports, with Max Kaiser successfully winning his kickboxing match in London and Mad Bitcoins and the Sacramento Bitcoin Group attending the Sacramento Kings game, paying entirely in Bitcoin. Personally, I thought it was a lot of fun to buy a magnet from the team store in Bitcoin, not having to deal with any change or having to swipe a piece of plastic from my wallet. But let's hear your ideas. Why should sporting teams take Bitcoin? How can Bitcoin improve the fan experience? Should other sporting leagues get involved? Chris J. Well, we had a lot of fun last Saturday night. Um, I was one of the co-organizers of the, the kickboxing championship. And the idea by Matt O'Connor, the, the entrepreneur who started it all, uh, was that people should really be taking Bitcoin for granted. We shouldn't really be questioning uh, why Bitcoin could be sponsoring a kickboxing championship. So he wanted to kind of bring it into the mainstream. He was very quixotic and ambitious. He booked out the O2 in London, which is a very big, prestigious, expensive venue. Uh, but the people that showed up uh, really enjoyed it. They had a great time. We even had a few of the people who were critical of the idea. Some of, some of us kind of early on accused us of being a little bit gimmicky. Uh, but actually, I spoke to one critic last night in a meeting, and he actually came around to the idea once he saw all the press about it uh, in Coindesk and people talking about it on Twitter, they were like, hey, actually, you should do this a little bit more often. I think um, sports uh, has a way of uh, bringing people together, particularly like uh, if you remember World War One on that day on Christmas when uh, the, the troops on the, the front line started playing football together. It has a way of um, bringing together the two tensions between different tribes. So it, it certainly has a mass appeal. I still would love for a soccer team uh, to adopt Bitcoin. Christoph Atlas. Well, I think that uh, sports, the, the people that are involved with managing sports, the players could be hugely benefited by cryptocurrencies, uh, particularly through the mechanism of smart contracts, because this is a way of doing more of the negotiations and enforcement of agreements through cryptographic means as opposed to with lawyers. I, I imagine that quite a bit of money uh, that's in sports is sunk into lawyers on both sides of the aisle. Um, so I think that would be better, very, very beneficial. Um, I also wonder, though, uh, how popular are sports going to be in the future when we have a cryptocurrency-based economy? If you think about the open design of the blockchain and the level of accountability, a lot of the stadiums that are out there are built with taxpayer money. This is money that's being taken from people, no, not voluntarily. This is just uh, kind of being snatched out of their hands, and they build, they erect these giant facilities in which to, to have sports. Of course, sports have been long used by the state as a means of simulating combat and uh, getting people into the spirit of military uh, conflict as well. So I wonder exactly what sports are going to look like in, the, in that kind of future. Um, I wonder exactly how sports teams would and, and leagues would hope to uh, pay for the facilities where these uh, sports are being conducted. So that's, those are a few things that I'm, I'm curious about, and I'm not exactly sure yet how cryptocurrencies are going to affect sports. Some good points, Christoph. I like the idea about linking the contracts to the blockchain. A lot of the contracts are incentive-based. If you get 50 touchdowns, you get a certain bonus. I'd like to see that paid out automatically through the contract rather than through a legal system. Derek J. Sports are a unique uh, arena, so to speak, in this area of Bitcoin development because I haven't seen anyone yet take advantage of the possibilities of ticketing through something like a colored coin where you could uh, issue your own tickets and then allow the people who bought them to buy and sell and trade them amongst themselves and each other and they could do that all cryptographically. It would save them money in sourcing their ticket master or whoever processes their tickets 
and it would also make their fans happier because they could buy and sell them uh, without that being illegal. <laughs> and they, they would be able to cryptographically prove ownership. It's a unique idea, and it hasn't been done yet. Sports could be the new way in. That would improve the ability to sell tickets online as well. You could send them the actual colored coin instead of sending them a virtual ticket. It would be one and the same. Paige, your thoughts? Yeah, I guess kind of going off of what Derek was saying, uh, another option is uh, for the sports teams themselves to make their own cryptocurrency that could act as a way to kind of keep it within the, the area because sports teams are generally based in certain regions. So um, doing something where it's a little more innovative on their part and they can sort of um, announce a new technology that they're experimenting with is good for them. Um, also, just the aspect of buying things online. Um, maybe the in-person purchases aren't as necessary or um, you know, beneficial using a cryptocurrency, but certainly the online purchases, and most of the ticketing is online purchase. So um, I would definitely like to see um, sports kind of play around with maybe their own cryptocurrencies. Um, I guess that goes to say also for um, any kind of event arena or uh, performer. I think it's a great idea, Paige, for a sports team to have their own currency. They could offer discounts on jerseys. And what's great is once your, band, once your fans buy your currency, there's nowhere else to spend it. It's a closed loop. Whether you're a rock star, or a sporting team, or even a whole sporting league. I mean, there's some danger, there's some coding difficulties, obviously, but with the more and more meta coins and master coins and what have you, it would be a lot easier for them in the future. Exit question. Think outside the box. What smaller sporting league could get some free press by accepting Bitcoin? Bowling? Fencing? Curling? Chris J. I actually don't like the idea when um, smaller companies try to use Bitcoin as a way of like piggybacking off of its awareness, and so I'm not, I'm not really a, a very keen on that. Christoph be Atlas. Pretty win -win. All right. Christoph Atlas. Uh, maybe college Quidditch, Quidditch teams could uh, t do that. There you go. And, and, you know, they could raise more money to uh, the fight the brooms overseas. There's a lot more options for them. Derek J. Rather than a small sporting league getting free press uh, in itself, I, I think all local teams of any sport should advertise that they accept Bitcoin uh, because Bitcoin is as local as it is international. So if you play on a sports team just for fun and you invite people to come and attend in the audience, maybe you charge for tickets. Uh, if you tell the customers in the newspaper or online that you accept Bitcoin, that's going to get people like me out there who otherwise wouldn't be attending a sports event, but I want to support their Bitcoin efforts. They could have a special Bitcoin day, sell it at the concessions, and maybe raise enough money to run their local baseball league for 10, 20 years. Who knows? Paige, any small leagues you'd like to see? Uh, someone last week mentioned uh, UFC. I think that would be interesting just because they tend to have a, a small group where they're really, really uh, you know, passionate about the sport. Um, yeah. I don't know too much about other sports, though. Definite, definitely a growing group there, the UFC. I would like to see them accept it. Moving on. Issue two. Investors offer to buy Mt. Gox for one Bitcoin. It's not clear whether they'd be taking on the debts of Gox or just buying the name, but I've heard they've offered customers a 20% return on their lost funds, which isn't great, but is better than nothing. Should Mt. Gox come back? Is the brand strong enough to return? Christoph, Atlas. Hmm. Um, I have an alternative proposal for them. Uh, maybe they could have a series of ship uh, ships that they're going to produce. Uh, take people on cruises. They could call it the uh, Titanic Cruise Line. And um, you know, I think it, it could be really popular because the Titanic is very well known. So many great memories of the Titanic. Derek J. Uh, no, their their brand is um, unfortunately not strong enough to return with any positive uh, memories. Anyone who heard about Mount Gox uh, and was 
naive or new to Bitcoin thought that Bitcoin itself had crashed and that was a big problem, caused a lot of confusion. I would not welcome Bitcoin into the Bitcoin, or I would not welcome Mt. Gox into the Bitcoin space. Paige Peterson. So maybe the branding is a little tainted, but I do enjoy the aspect of trying to uh, help the people that did lose Bitcoins in uh, the process of them going bankrupt. And I think that was the general uh, purpose of uh, what they were trying to do in buying it out. They, um, they said that they were going to work towards building charity so that they could, um, you know, help these people um, without... Ne like needing to go to regulators and so all these people are getting helped kind of in the free market through a charity that is being set up um, in the aftermath of Mt. Gox. Maybe not using the brands, maybe calling it Mt. Gox uh, something else, but... Uh, a gathering yeah. online exchange? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but definitely uh, maybe not as an exchange because that could be uh, bad for the brand, but as something else that would help to reimburse the people that lost their bitcoins. Could you imagine if they came back as an exchange and failed again? Would that be the <laughs> greatest story ever? Like, like we get some whole new guy to to blame, you know, Jack Carpellis, Fred Carpellis, somebody else comes in, you know? That would be great. Yeah, I was going to say if they do launch it as uh, Mount Gox 2.0, I would not do what Silk Silk Road 2.0 did and keep the name of the leader like the, the name Mark Capellis should just not be carried forward. It's going to be used to um, actually heard that um, in one of the test versions of open transactions, um, when one of the servers goes rogue and is proven to uh, have uh, to not be solvent uh, cryptographically, they call that uh, like a, a Carpellis condition or something like that. Um, <laughs> so that's that's the that's the way that name is going to move forward, not um, you know being adopted by the next uh, Gox 2.0 CEO. I wish they were still doing episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation so they could go to some strange planet and dis discover a Carpellis. Chris J., your thoughts? I think I have some concerns about the fact that essentially what they're proposing is a, it doing a, a sort of a, a Ponzi scheme by permission because essentially what you're saying is, well, we have got some funds. We know for a fact that MT Gox does have some liquidity. It had at least 30 million left in the bank. It also recovered, apparently, allegedly recovered 200,000 Bitcoins all of a sudden when he found a paper wallet under his cat next to his keyboard, if you remember. And so what should happen, in my view, is that, that those funds should be divided up between all of the creditors, the people that have the money on the exchange just be handed out equally. What this company is proposing is that in light of the fact that there's so much, um, as they said, it was an information vacuum around the uh, the, the internal finance of um, MC Gox. They were just going to give this nominal fee of, of one Bitcoin. They'd then inspect it, take a look at it, then reboot the brand and then try to pay people back based on trading fees. But of course, that not that just a Ponzi scheme? You're just stretching the problem out even more than you were before. So I think it's probably just better to, to let a sleeping dog lie and, and just uh, give people their money back based on what's, what's left in, inside of the company. It sounds like a lot what was done by uh, CoinX and um, Silk Road 2.0, some of the other exchanges that have run into trouble. But what's different about their situation is they were still able to do this while they were still solvent, while they were still in exchange. Mm. Uh, Mt. Gox has gotten to such a disastrous condition now where they've shut themselves off for so long. I don't mm. know if they'd be able to recover the, the trading potential that these people see in it, uh, as well as recovering the trust. Uh, I'm sure everyone remembers Silk Road 2.0 was hacked just like Silk Road 1.0. I mean, the, all the money was taken at one point. There were some issues. So, any more on that? Moving on. Issue three. Bitcoin side chains. How about instead of altcoins, we just have a series of side chains that interoperate with Bitcoin. This way, the Bitcoin network and its ASIC-generated hash rate could benefit all coins. The downside is that it might kill all the current altcoins. Should Bitcoin itself be the laboratory for new coins, or should they stay as separate altcoins? I ask you, Derek J. This is a real tough question, a great one to be asking, because I see benefits, of course, in having the laboratory uh, happen in networks other than Bitcoin, so that if they fail or uh, new ideas are tried and, and uh, are damaging, then... Um, 
it's just an altcoin that's affected. I don't know. Uh, I'd be curious to hear what the other panelists think if uh, a problem with one of these side chains could affect Bitcoin. That's something I'm not aware of. But as a newbie, I would look at this situation and say, you know, I'm, I'm fresh to Bitcoin. Like, oh, great, yeah, just go ahead and do it. You know, work, work it all onto Bitcoin. That way it's easy. I just have to follow Bitcoin. But if I were someone who's been developing an altcoin for a few years, I would clearly object uh, because it might threaten my altcoin. So this is a tough one. Uh, I, I'm not sure where I stand on this. Paige Peterson. So as far as I know, the, the points of these side chains is that you, uh, if something were to happen to a side chain, only those... Um, Bitcoins and transactions in that side chain would be affected, and it wouldn't have um, a larger effect on on like the main blockchain. Um, that being said, I am not a fan of this because it's just centralizing the whole uh, like the whole idea of cryptocurrency into Bitcoin, and I think that having the alternative options. You know, um, they talk about how, um, you know, if one of the side chains fails, then um, Bitcoin, is, it's like the main blockchain isn't affected, but what if the main blockchain fails and all of those side chains also fail? It's a very centralized way to structure it, and I'm in general a favor in favor of uh, com competing currencies. Um, they can offer different benefits, and they can, um, you know, they can off. They can again. They can be for you know, different companies or sporting teams offering their own cryptocurrencies. So I don't. Um, I I mean, if they want to do it, like I don't think it'll kill alt altcoins. Uh, it, it's it might be a good thing to try, but um, as like the end result to getting rid of all the other altcoins, I don't think that's a good idea at all. It seems like its very definition is a distraction from the development of Bitcoin. Yeah. Chris J. Yeah, so I had quite a lot of thoughts about this. I've been reading a lot about it. Are you, uh, If you're watching this, you should definitely check out episode 99 of Let's Talk Bitcoin, which is where Austin Hill and uh, Adam Back, who's the creator of Hashcash, which is what Bitcoin was based on originally, um, you should go listen to their interview. They do speak at length about this. Let's just remind ourselves of what Bitcoin gave us. Bitcoin gave us digital scarcity. The first time you had uh, digital assets that could be replicated, but you'd be able to trace them infinitely, which meant that they could be finite at the, at the uh, day zero when you launched it, right? So if you said there were only 21 million coins, there would only be 21 million coins. Now, what has happened is one of the most important features of Bitcoin was that it was open source, and making something open source is about giving up the need for control. You're saying that I don't necessarily want to own this in perpetuity. What happened then is, of course, everyone started creating their own scarcity, and so you had all of these different races for scarcity. Adam Back's anxiety was that this would dilute and undermine the very uh, thesis behind Bitcoin, and indeed I think that Bitcoin, most of Bitcoin's vulnerabilities lie within inside of it, within inside of the actual concept. But let's make sure that we're clear. What's decentralized is not the protocol and it's not the um, implementation, it's not the code, it's the idea itself. All of these altcoins simply represent the same idea in a different location. And so they are very valuable and there's still a lot of unanswered questions about these sidechains, about whether or not you'd be allowed to have a proof of stake sidechain uh, alongside of the proof of work uh, as the main chain. The innovation here, it's key to point out, is really just the pegging. What happened was uh, they worked out that you could have a test net. We already have test nets already. So if we want to experiment at Feathercoin, we just create a Feathercoin test net. Some of the miners sacrifice some of their hashing power with their, their mining rigs. They point it at the test net, and then they start doing all kinds of crazy stuff on the test net. What happens is you start getting feather coins on the test net, which aren't really worth anything. I mean, you could try sending them to somebody, but they'd be stupid to give you money for them because as soon as that blockchain dies, they're not really worth anything anymore. So what the developers have done in this case, and Adam Back is proposing, is this two-way pegging, which is where you'd be able to send bitcoins into this side chain of Bitcoin. You wouldn't be able to generate bitcoins from within inside of it. And if the side chain were, were to fail, okay, you'd lose those Bitcoins. But if it were to succeed, you'd be able to spend those Bitcoins back into the main chain, which would mean that any negative externalities, if you produced anything that went wrong, it wouldn't affect the main chain. 
I do not see this in any way as being a threat to, to altcoins, and of course I would say that, wouldn't I? Check my uh, bottom third below. But because mainly because Litecoin and Feathercoin and Doge could all integrate their own side chains, they could just integrate it at their own level. You're still going to need what these altcoins represent. Okay, is they represent um, divisibility by diversification. You've still got the issue. Well, one of the most important things about all of these tech companies, whether it's Bitcoin as an organization or whether it's you know Square or any of these other Twitter, Facebook, is they're mostly just marketing operations. Okay, you've got a, a little tech company and then you've got a huge, massive, great big marketing operation sat on top of it. I think I got that quote from Peter Thiel. And essentially it's just about persuading other people to back you. I think the insight that Adam Back has come up with here, and he also did an interview with Andreas Antonopoulos in December, was that the value of your coin is coupled very, very tightly with the ongoing engineering costs of the actual code base. I think what he's started to realize is that if you don't have that ongoing development at the, at the level of the coin, miners can just switch off their mining power. Yes, it might be a multi petahash network at the moment, uh, Bitcoin is, but it might not be forever because, of course, a lot of people, a lot of miners could just choose to cut their losses and just turn their mining rigs off. They do consume a lot of electricity after all. So, no, I, I don't think this is healthy for competition. Um, there's also a quote, if I may, there was a quote that Austin Hill made in episode 99, which kind of gave me some cause for concern. And I might be taking this out of context, but I'll just read it out so, by way of response. Um, when you start looking at embracing or extending the functionality to include part of their asset base, he's talking about financial institutions, encoding into blockchain technology, you can start to see the demand for Bitcoin will far outpace the availability and will ultimately drive up the price of Bitcoin. Now, obviously, I'm taking that out of context. That's around 30 minutes in. You should definitely go listen to it, and I'd love to hear what you think. Um, but that, for me, just kind of gives me cause for concern. I wonder what the intention is here, because if we all put all our eggs into one basket and we all put it into Bitcoin and we put all the innovation around Bitcoin, then what if Bitcoin fails and what if we don't see you know, something else coming? I think diversity is key here. Christoph, Atlas, your thoughts? Um, I think this is a fantastic idea, not necessarily the idea uh, that we should merge all existing altcoins or future altcoins into side chains, but just the technology in, in general. Uh, for example, with zero cash, which was the evolution of zero coin, um, I think that it would probably fit naturally as a side channel, whereas as an altcoin it's a little bit awkward. Uh, keep in mind that when you launch an altcoin, it's not just a matter of cryptography. You're launching a currency, which means that you need to have the economic savvy as well in order for the currency to be successful in the long term. I think there's a lot of altcoins that are out there right now that ultimately will not exist in the future or their, their value will dramatically drop because of the lack of economic savvy that their designers have. So I think that there, there will be space for altcoins. There will be space for... Uh, these these side chains and so forth. I'm very confused by the economic argument that somehow, since people can create more and more altcoins, this is inflating the uh, cryptocurrency supply. I find that to be very very confusing because that's ultimately we're just, you know, if we uh, keep adding new altcoins, uh, most of them are not going to be worth anything, and I don't see that they particularly affect the uh, value of the majority of the other coins that are out there, especially Bitcoin. They affect Bitcoin the least. Um, so if someone creates a new alt currency, and or if they create a thousand of them, and they have a million bajillion units of currency, um, I'm not sure why we should care about that at all. Uh, it's going to fail probably, and you know, so the person wasted their time, and people that tried to get in on it, you know, wasted their money. But eventually, well, people will figure out that a lot of these schemes are pumps and dumps, and they will start to develop the savvy to identify which uh, altcoin proposals are actually have something behind them and have the right kind of t team behind them to make them go somewhere, and they'll be able to identify the projects that are just bullshit. I think we have a lot of bullshit in the ecosystem right now, but it's just because it's new and people don't have uh, the, the wherewithal to identify that quite yet. So 
I, I'm, I'm confused by this argument. I'd like to see some more statistics, data, some hard evidence to back up the idea that we have an economic problem with cryptocurrency inflation, that somehow that these many, many altcoins that are going to be created are not going to just be lost in the end of the long tail of cryptocurrencies. And so I think that's important because it, that, that, is, that hinges the, the argument that we should merge all these altcoins into as side, uh, side um, currencies for Bitcoin, it hinges on this idea of uh, that there's a problem there, and I don't see that this is necessarily the case. So I think this is just going to be another complementary technology, another uh, piece of technology in this Bitcoin 2.0 space. I don't expect Ethereum to jump into this the side uh, currency stuff. I don't see that happening with uh, Mastercoin or some of these other things. So they're just I think they're going to continue continue doing what they're doing. And keep in mind. Um, at this point, we should we should learn that whenever these new projects are proposed, we um, they're going to take a long time to come to fruition. You know, they always say like, "Oh, we have this new idea. It's the best freaking thing since sliced bread, and it's going to be here tomorrow." And then tomorrow comes and they're like, "Ah, yeah, about a week." And then you know, a week comes along, they'll be like. We're shooting for you know Q1 2016. There's all these legal issues, and we need to pay the developers. And a bunch of people left our project to jump on this other new project. And so um, I'm not I'm not worried that the altcoin uh, space is going to collapse and it's all going to fall into uh, side side chains. I just uh, I, I think that it's this is something that is going to be a gradual change over time, and some altcoins will remain on the outside. I just thought of an idea tying this into our last topic. Maybe the National Football League could create their own Bitcoin. Then they could create side chains for each one of their teams so that you could hold individual team currency. Then maybe there could be an exchange rate even where certain team coins were more valuable, less valuable. All kinds of options. It's all right there. It's a whole wonderland of cryptocurrency options for the big corporations to come play with. Hopefully they will. Moving on, issue four. Dogecoin and Litecoin merged mining. Similar to the last question, a bug was discovered in Dogecoin, which may require Dogecoin to merge their mining with Litecoin, gaining a technical solution to the problem, but also giving up their mining power to Litecoin. What are your thoughts on merged mining? Should Dogecoin join Litecoin? Paige Peterson, your thoughts. I have to admit I'm not too aware of the technical implications of this, but as um, just kind of philosophically, I think it's an interesting experiment to sort of um, introduce cooperation in the in the face of competition. So um, just you know showing that um, these two competing currencies are you know they're they're trading against each other in the market, but um, when it comes down to it, if both of the communities that are uh, using them want this to happen and think it should happen and want to come together to make it so that uh, Dogecoin and Litecoin can continue to exist, then I think it would be a great um, opportunity. And I'm, again, like, I don't know about the technical implications, but I think it's an interesting uh, a thought to do, and I would be for it. Chris, Ellis. So Cobley has actually made this same offer to Feathercoin last year, and the skepticism was on the forum, on the Feathercoin forum at the time, was that essentially it was like a poison chalice. It was a, a way of killing Feathercoin because what had happened was that we had uh, introduced a, a competitive edge, just as what Litecoin did to to Bitcoin, uh, Feathercoin did to Litecoin. It contextualized it on a uh, an extended continuum. And because the hash rate is finite, uh, what you do is you take away the hash rate from one coin and you give it to the other. And actually, I think that that's perfect. Just like I said, the, the side chains and the altcoins could coexist. So it's right that you should have to compete for hash rate. It's a very powerful signal of strength. Um, so essentially what's happening here by the looks of things is that Cobley's trying to position himself. He can see that Dogecoin has taken away a lot of the Litecoin hash rate. In fact, I believe in some of the Dogecoin uh, marketing material, it did actually feature um, Litecoin being trodden on by a, a row of um, communist troops, if I recall. So there, was, so there was some aggression and some provocation from the outset. Now, I would recommend everyone go visit the Merge Mining AMA, Ask Me Anything, which is Cobley 
probably actually did on the Dogecoin uh, Reddit. Uh, I posted the link in the sidebar. I don't know if you can uh, post that, Tom, in the main thread. And I'd recommend you go read it. But also, there is a merge mining article on the Bitcoin Wiki, which is fairly um, Googleable. I recommend you clue yourself up on it. I think what, what this would mean is it, it would do more favors for Litecoin than it would for Dogecoin. It would also lock Dogecoin into scripts or whatever Litecoin wants to do in the future. For example, if Dogecoin wanted to move to a different algorithm, that would suddenly become a non-trivial uh, thing for them to do because they would be locked in. So they'd have to hard fork again. Obviously, you don't want to be hard forking your blockchain uh, too many times because that requires everyone to do a mandatory update of their, their wallet and that's not that's suboptimal. So I would be a little bit skeptical if I was uh, uh, at Dogecoin right now, but I think Jackson Palmer is a, a very smart guy and he'll make the right decision. Christoph, Atlas. Yeah, I think this is a, it's an interesting proposal. Um, I actually, you know, I wonder whether it could be beneficial for a Dogecoin in the long term. I feel like uh, one of the weakest thing of, things about Dogecoin as a currency, as a means of storing value, is their economic model, the inflation uh, basis for Dogecoin. Um, makes it something that I would not personally be willing to speculate on for the long term. It doesn't seem like a safe speculative vehicle for me. So at some point they're going to have to decide, is this always going to be a fun silly coin around memes and pictures and videos and stuff like that and tips? Or at some point do we hope that people are doing actual commerce with Dogecoin? And if it's the latter, then um, I would like to see them uh, take, a, take a more serious look at the economic side of things. Uh, maybe what they're doing is just working well for them and they can continue to scale that up to, the, you know, to whatever extent is possible. I don't know what the, you know, the ultimate market cap is for tipping people through uh, Reddit and Twitter and so forth, but maybe it's, maybe it's big enough that that's what Doge is happy to do. I, I, I'm not really sure, but uh, I think it's an interesting proposal and something worth, worthy of consideration. Derek J. I think this is great. This is a no-brainer to me. I mean, I, I would love to see um, the two most popular uh, altcoins, or you know, some of the most popular, join teams to fight this uh, Goliath. Not that I want uh, anyone to really lose, but I think the competition makes everyone better. Like Christoph mentioned, Dogecoin's going to get its act together on the economic side by joining with Litecoin. Hopefully they're going to see, like, <laughs> this thing can't persist on just being a funny meme. Like, uh, we're going to need to build in, uh, I don't know, more, more technicals into it. I, I see it as a huge win uh, because it means more competition and it means people are going to learn more about the cryptocurrency eco-space. Moving on, issue five. Journalist creates his own Bitcoin and suddenly learns it's not so easy. He used CoinGen, but ran into trouble when a flaw was discovered that he couldn't afford to fix. Still an impressive journey from calling Bitcoin Tulip Mania 2.0 to creating his own coin. Will we see more of these journalist conversions in the future? Will one of them succeed in creating their own coin? Will everyone have their own coin in the future? Chris J. Yeah, I think it's about the blockchain, though, not the coin. I think everyone will have their own blockchain in the future. Uh, how that translates, um, I don't know. I think a lot of these altcoins, what they want to be are, are um, digital assets, secure digital assets that are, that are finite. Um, but what they tend to be used for at the moment is money, because money is in very high demand at the moment. It's what people want. Um, so I, I think they're very good for adding value uh, around borders of trust, around borders of culture. I think I've said that a few times before. Um, so there are people that are working on, you know, try to get Aurora coin going in Iceland. Um, so I, I like these ideas, uh, but I don't, I don't think that setting up an altcoin is easy. I know because I've been uh, very closely a part of that process. It's definitely an experience that I would recommend though, although it's very hard work, very exhausting. I definitely recommend it as an experience. It was very enjoyable and I've learned a lot by doing it. Christoph, Atlas. For me this story underlines the fact that when critics of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies actually get their hands dirty and start using it, 
and start to under uh, understand some of the fundamentals of cryptocurrencies, they lose their criticisms. Uh, it sheds like you know a lizard skin, and they grow into their more educated, uh, future-proof uh, version of their journalistic selves. So uh, I think this is a fantastic story. And I wish that more journalists would have the balls to step up to the plate and you know give give these cryptocurrencies a try and figure out how they they truly work rather than rehashing the same tired, ignorant remarks about cryptocurrencies. It, it might have taken him a while, but I like the experimentation that he showed. I'm asking for all the panelists who are going to regulate Bitcoin to it at the very least try it buy some, send it around, spend some money, donate to a charity. He went way beyond that, making his own coin. It took him a while to get there, but I applaud him for going there. Derek J., your thoughts? Yeah, totally. It's it's good to see uh, someone take the lead in, in this realm of like being like, look, I'm just some journalist. Uh, I just learned about cryptocurrency, and I can do it. It's definitely going to encourage more people to look into it who think that they're not technical enough, and they, they'll learn that they are. Um, Will everyone create their own altcoin? Gee, I hope not. I don't want to have to follow a whole bunch of altcoins. I'd really like it if just a few succeed and I can just stick to those because um, there's already too much noise in this environment for me. And there's, there's more ideas, too, that maybe kids could make their own altcoin. They could try this out, trial and error. They could break it a few times, like I used to break windows all the time. They can, it's a learning sandbox for them. Cryptocurrency could be fun. So, Paige, your thoughts? Well, I actually do hope that everyone has their own blockchain. Um, I don't think it would necessarily be too hard to manage. You would just need the technology to be built around it. So um, there's things like uh, Ripple that exist where it's kind of like decentralized exchange. So if you want to um, trade one currency for another on the Ripple network, it kind of matches everything up for you and you don't even have to think about it. So I think um, the technology just needs to uh, come about in that, you know, the, the actual exchanging between currencies is a lot easier. And then, yes, I hope that everyone has their own blockchain. And that also kind of goes off of the whole uh, side chains uh, discussion from before. One of their arguments was, um, the difficulties between going between different currencies and the whole exchange process, but I think that whole bridging thing is going to get extremely easy in the future, and that is probably one thing that we should be focusing on, um, or I think I would enjoy to see people focusing on more than just like pumping out all, a bunch of different altcoins right now, yeah. I agree, and there's also a chance that open transactions is going to come through with an easy way for people to create their own altcoins. So there, there are definitely going to be a lot of altcoins in the future. Exit question. If your favorite journalist created an altcoin to support his or her work, would you buy it? Talibi coin? Palast coin? Barbara Walters bucks? Chris J. No, I'd just tip them. If they, if they wanted to create like a, a share, that's fine, but why does it have to be a currency? I really like what Paige is saying about the distributed exchanges. It's a very good point because that's probably the next thing to get distributed, at which point everything becomes a currency, absolutely everything, including uh, tokens on top of blockchains. Christoph, Atlas. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I think I would like to create a flow chart. It's going to be, should I create a new cryptocurrency and the vast majority of the boxes are going to go over to no. Um, I, I think that if people really thought critically a lot about about a lot of these cryptocurrencies, they would realize that it would just be better. They'd be better off using Bitcoin or some other uh, major cryptocurrency. Derek J. What to leave too good for Bitcoin? No, I'm just going to stick with what I know. Paige Peterson. Um, not until the, uh, the exchange uh, process is made a lot easier, maybe in the future, but not right now. All right, moving on to questions and answers. If you haven't sent your questions in, there's still a chance for you to send your questions in. Google is now telling me how to use the question and answers week uh, thing because it's 25 weeks in, so they've finally written a, a help program. So good job, guys. Way to put it in there for me. Thanks. Let's see. Um, We've got someone that's suggesting listening to episode 99 of Let's Talk Bitcoin about sidechains. 
and I would definitely suggest everyone listen to that if you're interested in the sidechain argument. Can I insert a question for the other panelists? I, I'd like. I heard people, a couple of people, mention this idea that they would like to see everyone having a blockchain, and so I'm curious about uh, what they envision being possible with everyone having their blockchain. What would be the point of that? What would be the benefit of it? A blockchain's a memory. So the the what we've been discussing on Twitter with Bryce and Andreas, and Andreas mentioned this at the conference uh, just before we went on holiday, was this idea like it would be like a blogging. Having a blockchain would be like blogging, and you'd be embedding all kinds of data, all kinds of witnessable and memorable events inside of the blockchain in order to make it permanent. But what's useful about having your own blockchain as opposed to people, multiple people sharing blockchain, a single blockchain? Oh, like I don't know. I'm not anticipating yet where the hash rate is going to come from necessarily. So it could be an Ethereum-based thing, for example. But I see lots of potential in reputation systems about uh, making a claim about something you can do, a capability that you have in the future, and then either succeeding or not, and then commenting on that on that uh, process. But there's going to be a very real necessity to want to keep that private to you. The rest of the network can see there is some activity going on, but you may wish to keep the encoding of that data private to you because you may not want everyone knowing what you're witnessing, for example. It, it sounds like if Facebook was a blockchain, but if Facebook didn't have access to your data anymore mm -hmm. because it was encrypted and only yes. your friends and friends of friends had access to your key and you would upload your photo into the blockchain instead of uploading your photo into Facebook, that yes. kind of sounds what you're talking about. And I'd like to see that. Let's see. Christoph, did that answer your question? or? Yeah, I guess so. I guess I'm, I'm sort of wondering, like, if we have all these different blockchains and we need, uh, do we need lots of different ways to secure the blockchains? Because right now, if you just create a new proof-of-work based blockchain, then it's pretty much worthless. You have no network effect. Um, you know, you, you, no one stops you from doing a 51% attack on your own blockchain. And so I'm not sure what kind of uh, integrity or authenticity those blockchains have. Um, I would kind of rather see people focusing on getting uh, public key data into existing blockchains and distributing those public keys so that they can put stuff in the uh, blockchain and uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain or one of these other more larger uh, blockchains that's already been secured uh, and encrypting it and then having some technology to mediate who gets access to the to the proper keys and so forth rather than I'm taking this kind of roundabout approach. What I see is about, about a roundabout approach. I mean, I know it's important to be kind of, you know, very humble <laughs> about what we expect to come out of these cryptographic technologies because yeah, if you asked me uh, two weeks ago about sidechains, I would have, it's nothing I would have conceived of. But um, I, I'm sort of confused about um, what the, the, the benefit is of having these many, many different blockchains um, uh, possibly replicating the same kind of effort, if that makes sense? Well, yeah, but remember that you have to separate the tokens from the actual memory function of the blockchain. It's a way of recording the sequence of activities, um, which is a very important thing. That's how clocks run. It's essentially a giant unstoppable clock. That's, that's what the blockchain is, provided that you're able to maintain the hash rate. And so we can't even anticipate right now what's going to be invented. What, all I know is that clocks are very important. Recording the sequence of events is very important. Ergo, therefore, I'm anticipating some kind of personable, witnessable blockchain that I'm able to encode in, in, into my own private you know, uh, personality. That's true, although I, I will note that we have... Uh, really, just one world clock that everyone goes off of, and then we have, you know, oh, kind of like twenty-four, next thing to be, twenty-four next thing time to be decentralized. Zones, then maybe that's the next thing to be decentralized. Yeah, maybe, maybe, the, cesium, yeah. the cesium standard is just <laughs> going to be contextualized, and we're all going to have our own clocks. It does seem like it's akin to the post office, where they stamp that information on your stamp that your stamp has been accepted and it's postmarked, mm -hmm. and that now mm -hmm. we have this universal postmarking system. We just don't know what we're going to use it for yet, other than currency, which we're trying right now, obviously. Uh, moving on to the next question, he says that there's um, there's no buy my coin pump and dump in the Adam back side coin proposal. So it is slightly different than the uh, the altcoins and the Charlie Lee. Um, it it is different. I wasn't I wasn't suggesting personally that he was trying to to get rich off of it. I was quoting Austin Hill in in the um, interview where he made a comment that that 
to me subjectively came across as like okay so is the purpose of this to try and get the price of or is part of the intention of this to try and get the, the price of Bitcoin to go up on based on the assumption as Christoph pointed out that these altcoins are somehow bringing the price of Bitcoin down because I don't think these altcoins are bringing the price of Bitcoin down that, that's that's all my it's comments. It's tough to really. say I mean I think a lot of people saw Bitcoin as a bridge to get money into the altcoins where it flowed for a while but now yeah. it might have flowed back in it might have become less money. I don't know what happened to the money. So, uh, the user crypto coin user also says that the sidechain proposal is a leap of faith to end all leaps of faith. <laughs> I agree. It could be very bad if the yeah. sidechain somehow infected the Bitcoin or caused a problem in an otherwise working system. So here's something funny and recursive. They'll probably need a sidechain for the sidechain initially. So you're, what you're probably going to get, no kidding, you're going to get a test net that's going to have a sidechain on it, and they're probably going to have to test that for a year or so. But remember, th these are not costless activities. So you do have to divert otherwise useful hard mining hardware at a test net. So this is not free. This will cost you money, especially considering these ASICs are not cheap. It's fine with Feathercoin because all you're doing is pointing a graphics card at a, at a network. And in fact, you don't even have to use your best graphics card. You can just use a, a cheaper one. But when you're talking about ASICs, where all the ASICs have a very start, you know, high starting price, that's going to cost people real money. And at the moment, they're not even talking about merge mining straight, straight away yet. They're considering merge mining. But then you've got to go to the pools and you've got to negotiate with them and tell them, look, it's worth your while merge mining with this sidechain. At the moment, the only uh, incentive to mine a sidechain would be the transaction fees. Crypto coin user also says that silos are for storage. Interoperability is for innovation, safety, and robustness. Mm -hmm. Good comment. Yeah, that's good. Let's see. Uh, we also have a comment. He guessed at Nair. says, don't forget a shout-out for Bitcoin Expo 2014 happening in Toronto, April 11th to April 13th. That's right now. It even says it's where Christoph is. Christoph, are you in Toronto? No, I'm not. Are you going to go? Uh, no, unfortunately, I don't have the pocket change to just jet off casually to Toronto. So, I, I am told that Will Pengman is tr in Toronto representing the Bitcoin group. So if you see Will Pengman, say hello from me. And we might be joined by them later, but I'm not sure if they're going to make it. But we'll see if that happens. Uh, Mr. Axe says that last week's prediction came true. Storage in the blockchain. It's very true. The Made Safe company announced they are raising safe coins to put files in the blockchain to hold them for you, kind of like Dropbox, but more long term and more along the postage stamp um, postmark idea, or even a more serious idea, the notary idea, where a significant person comes in and signs it, and you sign it, and they stamp it, and it's official. Well, you could just put your official documents in the blockchain now. It's pretty much the same system. So we'd like to see more of that in the future. Just a little uh, clarification on that, actually. Um, so uh, MateSafe isn't um, based on the blockchain at all. It's based on a consensus network. So um, there isn't uh, a central blockchain where um, you can find all of the different places that things are stored. Um, it's, it's very, very, it's almost like a decentralized blockchain. Um, it's a very interesting uh, technology, and I'm actually extremely excited about it. Um, there's uh, a subreddit and stuff like that. I highly recommend people go check it out. And that's the Made Safe sub subreddit? Made Safe, yeah. Very good. We've got a question for Chris Ellis. Mr. Chris Ellis, how did the debate go with Ben Dyson from Positive, Positive Money? I tried responding to his blog post. Uh, did you manage to change his mind at all? Well, I certainly piqued his curiosity. He sent me a really nice email after the debate saying thank you so much and that he'd learned a lot. So I do plan on doing another one with him. I think I think he brings up a really good point because Ben isn't um, a, te a technical geek, but he is very uh, well versed on economics. So from the outside looking in, I felt that it was important to have his opinion on it. And his opinion on it is that Bitcoin is just a prototype. And this argument comes up all the time on the Bitcoin Talk Forum about whether or not you know Bitcoin is analogous to you know uh, AOL or MySpace. Space, even though those were centralized companies, um, or whether it's more analogous to TCP/IP, um, I think all analogies are wrong. 
um, metaphors are useful for a while. It helps you to, to get grips on something. But Bitcoin will just be what Bitcoin is. But I, I don't think that his criticism is entirely unmerited. It may well be that the whole world has to catch up in its understanding because at the moment everyone's at very different levels of understanding of, of Bitcoin. Some people have a very deep level of understanding, and but most people just have vague awarenesses. They know that it's some kind of internet-based currency. Some people even understand that it's not controlled by any central authority. It may well be that Bitcoin has to fail so that we can relaunch the whole thing with everyone in the world being copacetic, with everyone in the world having a good understanding of it. That, that was what he was introducing. One flaw in Ben's argument that I didn't pick him up on enough in the debate, but I will do next time, is if he's suggesting that the economics of Bitcoin is flawed, I'd be interested to know if he knows what the answer is. Or, you know, so I, okay, so what would you do with positive coin then, Ben? Like, what would positive coin look like? Um, what kind of monetary supply? Because none of these coins so far have had good launches. There is no such thing as a perfect launch. All of them, um, to some extent, have their own struggles. And actually, I think what you're going to see is a fitness function emerge, where we start to look back over these altcoins over a number of years, and we start to say, OK, it turns out that advanced checkpointing is a pretty key feature that you want early on to stop your altchain being forked. Um, but actually, the length of time that you have the uh, advanced checkpointing will also be a negative indicator of success, because the longer you need it, presumably, the, the worse job you're doing at stabilizing uh, the hash rate. So there'll be all these kinds of things that we're going to be learning over the next few years about how uh, well these coins survive and of course it leaves open the question of inflation whether or not an inflationary coin can survive in an ecosystem of deflationary currencies. I'd like to comment on the positive money guys uh, proposals for fixing things mm -hmm. so this is um, on positivemoney.org slash our dash proposals so he proposes three ways of fixing money. I'm just going to focus on the first one. Number one, money should only be created through a democratic and transparent body working in the public interest. Uh, so he says um, he'd like to see something like the Bank of England or a new committee that decides whether to create money. It should be accountable to parliament and protected from abuse by vested interests. And... <sighs> I, you know, it's hard for me to take seriously <laughs> um, someone's economic criticisms of Bitcoin when this is their proposed solution to the existing financial system. Um, the idea that you're going to somehow take over the reins of government by forming a new committee and um, cast some magic spell that's going to insulate it from corruption is truly naive. I mean, that's a staggering kind of statement to make, it's as if this hasn't been tried in the past. Um, I think that's. I think that speaks for itself. It does seem like they're taking a very philosophical, experimental approach to something that, because of Satoshi's work, has become real. Like Satoshi didn't uh, need to consult with this super government committee. He didn't need to get them all to agree. It was more of a math uh, programming issue, which he was able to work out with the help of other people and the internet, et cetera, et cetera. But th this is so, Christoph. You bring you bring up an excellent point, and this is what I mean when I say everyone's at very different levels of understanding. You know what it's like sometimes when you meet someone and they come up with a counter argument to your, particularly an argument maybe a belief that you've held for a long time that you held very dearly, and all of a sudden somebody comes up with a really cutting. A criticism, a devastating criticism of your belief. And it's very, very difficult in that moment, and I've done both things. I've either defended a belief that I knew wasn't true, that's called bad faith when you do that, um, or I've gone, okay, you're totally right, I now need to go away, read that book, that, or wherever you got that information from, I need to go and read that. I sort of get the sense that it's a little bit that of uh, case of that with Ben. That's why I tried to set up that debate between you and him uh, and, and the other bankers on the panel because I do feel as though particularly the, the sort of libertarian crowd in the US, although that word means something very different in the UK, so I wanted to avoid it if possible, but I do think they can learn an awful lot in this country about some of the ideas that are coming from you and Josh and um, Michelle and, and, and Derek. So, um, but, but I wanted to do it and I still want to do it in a way that is constructive and philosophical where we get to the underlying issues and we don't just sort of say well if only you'd read so and so you know 1953 or this paper or that paper I'd rather we just keep it to the to the core issues moving on next question with the uh, 
I think this has to do with the recent drop in the NASDAQ and the drop of tech stocks. I'm going to ask the whole group, have we seen the top in the Dow and the bottom in Bitcoin? Chris J., what do you think? I'm sorry. Oh, oh right. So what, the, the, like the NASDAQ? Dude, if you look back at like the, the last 14 years of, of the Dow, you've got lower lows and higher highs, which means everything is volatile right now. It's not just Bitcoin. The whole world is volatile because information travels faster than it ever has before. And so we're learning things faster than we ever have before, which means we're intervening and we're acting more. We're deciding, we're making more decisions than we've ever made before. We're getting distracted more than we ever have before. So all of these um, markets are going to be uh, less stable in the future. I it is my belief, still my belief, that we're going to see a huge redistribution of wealth, particularly from west to east, mostly because in the west all I see is a lot of consumption. I don't see a lot of production. I think we're serving and waiting on each other in the west. I think particularly in the UK we're a nation of shopkeepers. Uh, we, if you go like around Google Campus or any of these kind of tech startup incubators, I mean the most popular startup category is the incubator. I'm not even kidding. Right, the most popular startup you can have is an incubator. You might as well just get your incubators inside of your accelerators. Accelerate your in incubators so that they can incubate more. Like it's just a joke. It's just parasitical. I got accused the other day of being anti-capitalist. I was shocked and mortified. I was like, no, this isn't capitalism. This is corporatism. Because all you're doing is you're getting a bunch of rich people crowding around a bunch of hipsters who are all, frankly, living off the bank of mum and dad, most of them, because the rental prices in London are like at least 1200 a month and your living costs are much higher than that. You can't compete on a global scale when you've got those kinds of outgoings. How are you meant to charge for a freemium product, okay, which is what most of the internet is? And most of these startups are selling software. They're not selling hardware. They're just doing social networking or they see a startup on Y Combinator. Um, and then they think, oh, that's a good idea. I'll do the same thing in Europe and then just try to reach a different market and then maybe Google will buy me out or something. You know, they have all these kind of weird exit strategies. And then you've got these vultures, these kind of angel investors. I call them vulture investors. And maybe, okay, they got lucky. They got overpaid for the last 10 years. They lucked out. And so now they want to, obviously, they want to make, take this money and they want to turn it into even more money because presumably they weren't happy with the money they made originally. And so what they do is they pump money in one end with the view to getting more money out of the other and they don't care about the customer, they don't care about the staff. Usually what they are is they're, they're called accu hires, which is where they, they buy the company not for its intended output but they actually buy it for um, the, the staff so that if it all goes wrong, and by the way it usually does, and none of these startups really succeed, maybe, maybe like 5% of them or something. Failure is the norm in this e e era. Um, they just take the stuff and then they re repurpose a lot of the products or they just you know can the product and put it somewhere else so that that is the nature of it I do expect the, the stock markets to be uh, more volatile in the future I don't I don't think this is the bottom for Bitcoin I'm not seeing a lot of strength in the price at the moment I think we probably will have to test 269 and it is going to get very scary for a while so watch your stock positions Christoph is this the bottom and the top um, I can't really speculate on whether the Dow is at the top. Um, I think that's fundamentally unknowable. We are, are in the in the West. We are are blown up on this incredible debt bubble, and we don't really know exactly when it's going to burst. It's going to keep pushing the stock markets up until finally we have the real reckoning. And it's going to happen at some point, but we just don't know exactly when that's going to happen. It's based on the highly chaotic backroom deals that are going on in Washington, D.C. and London and places like that. Um, as far as the Bitcoin uh, bottom goes, um, my sense is that we're not. You know, a lot of the growth that happened last year was based on the idea that the Chinese investors were going to come into Bitcoin and that the Bank of China was going to leave them alone. It doesn't look like that's going to be the case any longer. And so a lot of that um, positive, uh, that positive take on the Bitcoin price based on China's entrance is going to deflate. And... Um, so I, I think it could go lower. I would point people in the direction of Turo de Mister, who uh, the other day he tweeted out some 
analysis, some chart analysis that he did that I thought was very, very solid and very good, looking at some of the the recent highs and lows and where the resistances are and what the market, what the who the mar market movers have been during these different highs and lows. So I would check that out. Derek J. The low of Bitcoin, I don't know. Bitcoin could still go to zero. I don't think it will, but it could. And I'm more sure about the Dow. Uh, the top of the Dow, I'm calling at $10 million because inflation. Paige, your thoughts? So I actually met someone. Um, he's kind of like a traveling trader. He, he, he travels around the country. He calls himself Corn Feed Hobo. And he was telling me about how he thinks that the real price of Bitcoin should be somewhere in between $100 and $300 based on some like observances that he's done and like calculations with um, how many merchants are on BitPay and all of these other things taken into consideration. So I wouldn't be surprised if it went lower. Um, I'm not concerned though. I think um, obviously Bitcoin is more about the, the currency. It's about, you know, the, the protocol and the idea and that's what's really exciting about it so the price being lower probably but I'm I don't really care that much that just means it's gonna raise again eventually when I when I see people talking about the um, you know the innate or intrinsic value of Bitcoin I just have to roll my eyes at these people um, with their with their formulas and their calculations uh, no one knows what the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is changing from moment to moment. Like I said before, uh, with the sidechain stuff, that's something that I couldn't even, you know, I couldn't even told you that this was, you know, a possibility a couple weeks ago. And the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is based on what kind of utility people can get out of it at any given moment to transfer value from one place in the world to another. And it's constantly in flux, and there's no way to predict what cryptographic technologies are going to be just around the corner. So for I think that it's it's pretty silly. I've also um, you know I've heard people give their their calculations of oh it's got to trade in this range because it costs this much for the miners to do this and that. And I think that's just a small piece of the puzzle. Uh, the prices the price of Bitcoin is highly highly chaotic system. And no one's going to be able to predict exactly what the price is going to be over time. If they could, then they wouldn't bother telling us. They would just, you know, they would either go long or short and become multi-billionaires overnight. So, all right, a couple more comments from CryptoCoin user. He says you can buy the Bitcoin price dip with CoinbaseOrders.com. That's limit orders on your Coinbase account. I haven't checked that out, but if you're interested, check it out. See what it's like. There's also a notary software that already exists at proofofexistence.com. So you may already be, already be able to notarize your documents. I'm not sure if this is with the blockchain or if this is just a notary service, but it is getting there. The internet is starting to replace more and more middlemen. Yeah, so. the, the the proof of uh, the proof of the existence website. What they do is they'll they'll hash a file or a string or whatever that you give to them, and then later on you can you can take whatever the file is and say, hey, look, here's the file. Go ahead and hash it for yourself. And you look at such and such a date, you'll find that I put the hash there in yeah. the Bitcoin blockchain through this website. So it's a way of proving that you uh, documented this file at that particular moment in time without actually divulging the document itself. Very cool. And I think we're just going to close on one more comment from the questions and comments. Uh, he says, Educate the young sports participants to all things crypto and economics, and all management slash middle layers of team management would be eliminated and become obsolete. It's a good note to end on, and we're going to move on to predictions, story of the week, or final thoughts, the part where you get to add to the show. Are you ready? Chris Ellis. I've got to make a prediction. No, I can add a final story thought. Story of the right? week or a final thought. You have to choose. Uh, I'm going to go with a final thought, just because I can't predict the future any better than anyone else. And I'm, and I would say something like, 
I think it's got something to do with working as teams because my experience from last Saturday, I don't know if all of you know, but we had some technical difficulties. I put a lot of uh, energy and, and work into that debate and then it didn't go as planned. So I kind of spent a few days kind of beating myself up over it. But I, I would say that it's very important that we learn to work together. I think one of the, the biggest challenges we've got now that we're becoming a more de decentralized world is that a lot of these corporations do have very... Um, top-down authority which does create some illusion of order for a while right if you're being told what to do and you, you've got this kind of fear incentive that's making you do as you're told when all of a sudden you go into a world where it's more distributed and you're just spontaneously working on all these little projects which I think many of the people in our audience do because I've spoken to them over the months we've been doing this show oftentimes if you're the kind of person that doesn't like being told what to do then you won't like telling other people what to do and what can sometimes happen is you get a separation of people's priorities and their roles and so one of the biggest things I think that we all fear right now as these kind of entrepreneurs or these distributed entrepreneurs is that when I go into this project will my work be justified or will it just be wasted and so I still I think we should be collaborating a little bit more and working together on how we can um, you know uh, work together a little bit more efficiently without these kind of fear-based structures that we have in in these top-down organizations. I think that we've still yet to really tease out of the the protocol some of the core philosophies and which needs to be extended all the way up not just at the level of the code but also it's the level of society and the way we interact with one another. Good point. Christoph Atlas, your thoughts or prediction? I have an observation and I guess this leads to a prediction. So and this is very, very exciting to me. So I was at the uh, New York City Inside Bitcoins conference um, on Monday, and I had a guy that walked up to me. I'm not going to name who he is, but he is an editor at a, uh, a banking a publication. And one would expect that the an editor at a banking publication would be at best kind of neutral towards Bitcoin usually pretty negative and these are also people that tend to you know toe the party line and so forth and and stay clearly on their side of that thin green line that separates the bank from the banks from everyone else but what he said to me was look I'm really happy with the work that you're doing in the area of financial privacy I think it's fantastic love to see more of that going on and I was just thrilled to hear a comment from, from someone uh, like that, that's in that type of position. I think that more and more people are going to catch on to the idea that cryptocurrencies represent entirely new possibilities in terms of financial privacy. We haven't had financial privacy in any meaningful way for decades at this point. It's been dreadful. And we, we've had such little financial privacy that people that, a lot of people that grow up now just take it for granted that there's going to be people that are looking constantly into their pocketbooks and having access to that information all times. So not just from one party, you know, not just from the NSA or, you know, the, the IRS or someone else like that, but also Google and their bank and their credit card company and, you know, you name it. So I think that um, I'm hopeful that eventually one of these generations will catch on to this idea and that financial privacy will become a rallying call for their generation. That it's none of your damn business what I do with my money. If I want to trade peacefully with other people, then I should be allowed to do so and you should not attempt to step in my way. In fact, you are benefited by allowing me to do that because this is ultimately how real wealth is generated by people peacefully interacting and trading with each other. I'm very uh, encouraged by the work of the dark coin developers and the dark wallet developers. We saw some notable improvements with their tools and technology in the last week. And so moving forward, I'm very hopeful for the state of financial privacy and the advancements that we're going to see in this area over the next one to you two years. I don't think that we're going to see it coming. I think it's going to be amazing and it's going to be a kind of revolution. Derek J. Prediction. The IRS will reverse its position on Bitcoin after tax day comes and goes with record low numbers of people self-reporting to the authorities about the Bitcoins they own. Paige Peterson. 
So speaking of all of these conferences, Bitcoin conferences, I uh, predict that the conferences will kind of split off into two factions. The, there's going to be like the financial, like Bitcoin as a currency or altcoins as currencies kind of financial conferences. And then there's going to be this other side of the conferences that are just geared towards decentralized technology. Bitcoin is kind of the one that is like spearheading them all. But you see, peop you see companies like MadeSafe, and Ripple and all these different companies going to Bitcoin conferences, but they're not like related to Bitcoin really at all. I used to work for a company called Open Garden, and uh, they're they're making mesh networking technologies, and we were at the very first, or I'm sorry, the second Bitcoin conference, which I guess the first one was technically in England, but the uh, San Jose conference we had a table at just because we knew there was going to be a lot of um, a lot of interest in the whole decentralized internet access type of thing. So, um, yeah, in terms of the conferences and uh, the communities rallying behind Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, I think it's going to kind of faction uh, split off into the people that are interested in just the fact that it's decentralized and that it's helping people all around the world. And then, you know, the I guess I, you know, I heard a lot of stories about the New York conference being very regulatory and uh, kind of uh, not not the funnest uh, scene to be in as uh, libertarian minded. So. Well, you, you know, we can't have all of our conferences in San Francisco. I want to disagree with Paige. I actually think that all these new conferences are diluting. Uh, the existing conferences. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one conference. It's going to it's going to be a 24/7 conference. It's going to last 11 months out of the year, and it's going to be in Iceland. And uh, all the other conferences are going to be side conferences that are going to adjoin to the the main Bitcoin conference. <laughs> as long as it doesn't affect the hash rate of the original conference. Yeah. Very important. So Chris J, you have a Banksy quote for us. I just checked it out on Twitter. You should follow the real Banksy on Twitter. He says, if you behaved like your government, you'd be arrested. Excellent quote. And finally, a prediction. Bitcoin is awesome, and more and more people are learning about it every day. Maybe they use it to send some money to another country. Maybe to buy something at Amazon with GYFT. Maybe they just read a whole bunch about about it, but they wait to invest. But any way you look at it, the word about Bitcoin is getting out there, and you know what comes next. Critical mass. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.